Hi everyone, welcome to this second cultural activity, Silence Nature, the Taxidermy of the Living, that is presented on part of uh, Meryl McMaster, There Once Was a Song, which is an exhibition that is presented at the McCorn Museum. I introduce myself, Leila Friat, I'm a project manager in education, community engagement and cultural program at the McCord Museum. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge that we are on an unceded indigenous territory and that the Ganyan Geyaga nation has an historical attachment to this territory, which is called Jiljage. These lands were and are a gathering place for many indigenous nations and their ancestors. We pay respect, we pay our respect to them and those from other communities that may be with us today. We're very happy to be capable of meeting you today for this vir virtual event. Um, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Benedict Hamad from the Department of Art, Art History and Film Study at the University of Montreal, um, Meryl McMaster, Sarah Angelucci, and Giovanni Allord, um, art historian and professor at the School of Art Institution of Chicago. And I would also like to inform you that this activity will last 45 minutes in English. Uh, it will be followed by the 15 minutes uh, Q&A uh, that could be addressed both in French and in English via the uh, Zoom uh, platform and on the museum Facebook page. So welcome to all of you. Um, and uh, Benedict, I'll let you the, uh, the microphone. Thank you, Leila. Thank you for your invitation. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, our uh, guests, Meryl, Sarah, and Giovanni. So I'm going to share my screen to uh, show you some um, slides of the uh, exhibition of Meryl. Um, I thought it was important to uh, show you um, this exhibition at the Maker Museum, Il fut un chant, There Once Was a Song, which opened in April and uh, last until mid-August. For the first time, Meryl, you've created an exhibition where you combine photography, the art for you are the best known for, with video and sculpture. As we can see in these slides of your current exhibition, you also display two bell jaws and a glass fire screen from 1870, showing taxidermy boats, insects and plants, free Victorian objects from the McCurd collection. Your work questions the desire to capture and confine the natural world in order to freeze it in time, as numerous museums and collections did with the indigenous peoples and cultures. We will talk about that for sure. Uh, after opening our and uh, talking about your process of research and creation within the Macro Residency Program. We will open the discussion to Sara Angelucci, artist and photographer from Toronto. Sara Angelucci, among many projects and research she did within the last two decades, worked specifically with taxidermy, Victorian taxidermy, in fact, in this case of the exhibition Provenance Unknown, held at the York University Gallery in 2013. In this following slides you can see that she created a Victorian glass cage of stuffed birds from the 19th century in dialogue with a photographic series theory that mixes ex extinct and endangered birds in the Ontario Museum collection and cabinet called Petri Refotographed. And finally our third guest today is Giovanni Alloy, chief editor of Antennae, a British art news magazine dedicated to the living in contemporary visual art that you can find online, especially those two former issues you've edited, Giovanni, about taxidermy in 2008. And more recently, two years ago, in fact, you published Speculative Taxidermy, a book that analyzes the subject of taxidermy with contemporary artworks using the technique Jean Science Will Define that to Together. And um, so, as Leila said, I'm Benedict Hamad, I'm an art historian uh, based in Montreal and specialize in ecological issues in the arts, and I'll be your host today. Um, so, Meryl, uh, let's start together. Uh, can we talk briefly about the premises of the exhibition and what you, when you find the, the job there in the collection of the McCord and what it inspired you? Yeah, for sure. So, 
Um, I toured uh, the museum collection back in 2019 uh, when I started the residency program. And I was interested in exploring um, several different areas. I was looking at uh, the material culture, uh, the photography, the archival and Indigenous cultures collections at the museum as they all related to um, you know, my previous and current work in some way. And, um, you know, I combed through dozens of objects. It was actually the first time that I'd ever done a residency like this. So, um, so it's very interesting um, being able to kind of peek in and see, um, you know, all these different types of objects in these different departments. And um, I was drawn to um, several bell jars. Uh, and then as you saw in the first couple slides, um, a very large glass cabinet that was used as a fire screen. And um, these objects all um, contained uh, scenes of exotic birds and, and butterflies kind of uh, frozen in mid-flight, um, as well as insects and other kind of dried plant material. And, um, you know, they represented this kind of 19th century kind of bourgeois expression of, uh, you know, domesticated nature. And, um, you know, kind of looking into more of this, um, um, you know, it was kind of came across in, uh, you know, more kind of Victorian um, views and how they were very obsessed with nature, but, um, you know, kind of at the same time, they, they're both kind of more passive and had kind of a more narrow, um, yeah, kind of idea of what nature um, was. And, you know, nature was a commodity. And so, I kind of wanted to kind of unpack, um, you know, the concept that nature could be tamed or pruned or dissected um, or kind of arranged neatly in one's um, drawing room. And I wanted to kind of question why we have these desires to control nature. And so um, also thinking about the collections made me think about other um, techniques that were kind of flourishing in the 19th century, which were taxidermy um, and uh, cyanotype photography. So I created uh, three pieces um, in the exhibition um, uh, and I created a large sculptural piece um, in the middle of the exhibition space as well as a video and uh, a photograph. And it was actually the first time uh, that I've done um, you know, a sculptural piece. Usually, as you said, I'm, I'm known for my photographs. Uh, and a lot of my photographs contain a lot of kind of built elements and props and sculptural work um, that are incorporated um, into these scenes that I, I construct within the photograph. But um, yeah, it was the first time I kind of wanted to experiment with, you know, building um, an actual piece that in a sense was a standalone work um, in, in the exhibition space and working with sound as well, which is part of an element of the, the sculpture and then a video piece. So um, yeah, so the sculptural piece is titled uh, The Feather That Tomorrow Will Form. And um, I kind of look at it as this anti-bell jar. It's kind of this scaly reflective object um, kind of in the middle of this transformation, transformational process of kind of breaking and, and rebuilding. And, you know, it has this very armored feel, um, this kind of almost dangerous, you know, kind of pokey, you know, these big shards, um, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, pokey feeling. And, um, you know, kind of each of these shards uh, represent kind of these different perspectives. And, and I see them, uh, you know, kind of representing these um, perspectives of our relationship with nature in different ways. Um, and then it also, you know, kind of as the viewer walks around, it kind of distracts us a little bit uh, from what is kind of being kept safe from within. Um, and then atop of the bell jar is this um, uh, 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 double-headed crow um, that's kind of perched on top. And uh, it's kind of, um, yeah, this guardian I, I see it as. Um, the second work is a video piece um, that was hard to tell from the installation shop, but, uh, um, but it's called uh, For the Song That Is To Follow. And uh, in the center of this kind of digitalized um, murmuration, um, is kind of the single lifeless starling bird. And, um, you know, this kind of, I see this kind of murmuration, um, it's kind of paying tribute to one of its own, um, you know, through this kind of sky dance, um, this longing to be um, closer um, to the, you know, to their own um, in a way. So, and then, uh, well, lastly, the photograph, um, 
which is titled uh, When the Storm Ends, I'll Finish My Work. And it's a self-portrait, which, again, is something that is very um, common to my previous work. I mostly work in um, self-portraiture, self -portraiture, mostly outside. So this one was um, actually inside um, my studio space. Um, but you see, you see me or the character um, kind of resting atop this kind of this large stack of papers and all this natural kind of plant material um, that is kind of um, stuffed within. And, uh, and then I, the backdrop is I created this uh, really large cyanotype um, and it's kind of this canopy of decaying plant material that I found um, uh, from just around around my house and and as well as kind of other natural elements as well as other kind of animal specimens. Um, and, um, you know, the one of the there's lots of different layers from the photograph and its meaning but um, you know you know I kind of see this photograph as kind of a contemplation of the ways we accumulate knowledge and the impact from industrialization on you know the modern attitudes towards nature so um, yeah so that's just a little bit about um, the works that are in the exhibition space. Thank you Meryl um, you mentioned it uh, you have two birds uh, taxidermied in your own installations. One is a double head crow, so uh, a natural crow. It's, it's, a, it's uh, a figure, an animal figure reconstructed and the other is a sawing. Um, these are very common species compared to the very exotic species exhibited in the, in the um, glass uh, bell jaw. Um, do uh, these uh, species, the crow and the starling, have a special place in the Cree nation or maybe in your own cosmogony? Uh, usually you use birds are, are, as messengers. So what do they uh, become today? Yeah, so uh, I mean, as far as I know, there isn't uh, any connection uh, uh, to Plains Cree stories, specifically with the crow and the starling, but um, but there is connection in other ways. So there's actually a dance called the crow hop, um, which is a social dance at powwows, and um, the drum beat uh, mimics the hopping of the crow. And yeah, you can look up crow hop and you can, um, as a dance, a power dance, and you can kind of see the movements and, and kind of see how it mimics, mimics the movements of the crow. Um, but yeah, many dances in Indigenous societies, as well as Plains Cree, um, can often be inspired by um, animals and the movements of birds and other um, uh, common kind of dances, the uh, prairie chicken dance as well, which is another way of it, us mimicking uh, the movements of a bird. Um, and, but yeah, so I, I mean, I did use very um, um, common species of birds and I wanted to do this, um, you know, so that people would be familiar um, uh, with these with these birds from their daily lives and and uh, um, that were also native to this territory and instead of them being kind of um, exotic or interesting for their um, rarity the idea was more to uh, have familiar familiar faces confront the confront the viewer and um, you know this double-headed crow kind of represents this kind of transformation and change and um, can also be this kind of forewarning, forewarning of our neglect um, with the natural world and kind of these damaging effects that we can have on living things. Um, um, I, in terms of the starling, um, you know, I was, I've always just been fascinated by this kind of the, this kind of graceful, kind of synchronized, um, kind of aerial murmuration. Um, of starlings and and uh, just being really interested in how they um, travel um, during these murmurations as one organism and all responding to each other um, without kind of individual leadership. Um, I mean the uh, and kind of this the death of you know this 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 one starling. Um, you know I, I I did that as kind of. You know, kind of representing about how death can bring together many people and who share common concerns and, and community and death, death have this social function um, where, you know, a single death can have impact on many and 
and bring us together. So, um, so that's why I kind of chose um, a little bit about why I chose those those birds and yeah. Thank you, Meryl. I wanted to ask you, Giovanni, if it's more and more common for the artist to include um, common species, uh, taxidermy common species, and um, also showing um, animals dead, like the starling in the exhibition of Meryl. She shows uh, a live animal, the crow seems alive and the starling is obviously dead. So is it more and more common in uh, the contemporary practices to show the reality of uh, the animals and, and even some common species? Thank you, Benedict. Uh, yes, we can certainly say that there has been a steady trend over the past 20 years where taxidermy animals have become uh, much more readily available in the gallery space. One of the earliest um, examples of taxidermy is uh, Rushenberg's monogram at the very end of the uh, 50s, which is a reference point for contemporary practices and yet didn't trigger a, an invasion of taxidermy in the gallery space during the 60s and 70s. Taxidermy has more recently emerged in the gallery space as a symptom of our uh, fraught relationship with nature and as a metaphor, most often, of objectification. Uh, objectification of the natural world more in general, objectification of animals, also a representation of how little uh, value we have attached to animal life. Uh, also a catalyst for important ethical questions about the appropriateness of representation, the modality of representation in the context of nature and how natural history has constructed nature and our understanding of nature for us. So uh, artists over the past 20 years have engaged specifically like Merrill does uh, in this context. What I think it's interesting in Merrill's uh, practice is the use of taxidermy more specifically to um, represent something bigger than institutional critique, uh, but to bring focus on a Western modality in the relationship with nature that ultimately also entailed the silencing of indigenous cultures. So I think that that's where uh, Merrill's work brings something to the surface that's original and new uh, in the context of taxidermy in contemporary art. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, Sarah, I, I see you. Uh... <laughs> Acknowledging yes. what uh, Giovanni was saying, um, you worked also with taxidermy and uh, what was your um, perspective with uh, this specific, I don't know if we can call it a genre or a technique or a medium, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Yeah, it was quite a revelation for me. Um, I feel very connected to what Meryl has been talking about and in her incredible work. Um, I discovered taxidermy birds in the collection of the Royal Ontario Museum Ornithology Collection. And although, of course, I had, you know, all of us read about extinction and endangered birds all the time, I think to be in front of a, a, an extraordinary specimen that you know went extinct because of us, because of our, you know, callous overhunting, um, it really transformed that relationship from something theoretical to something very embodied for me. Um, and I think it really transformed my relationship with looking at environmental issues fundamentally. And, you know, researching this period of time, of course, like Merrill, I work in photography. I began to look at the 19th century itself um, colonization, you know, in a way, I think photography is a kind of type of taxidermy, really, if you think about it. So this, this kind of relationship between the colonial project, uh, collecting specimen, ruling over land, like the British Empire at this time ruled over a quarter of the land in the world and a fifth of its population. 
Um, so reading about this sort of fervor for science, which as Merrill mentioned, was a sort of um, commer a commercial co colonial way to handle the specimens of the world. I mean, I was reading some notes from previous talks and I found a note that said in 1862, ships were leaving Australia regularly with 20 to 30,000 parrots on board and most of them died, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, taxidermy was a way that they could preserve these birds because they couldn't live otherwise, you know, they, so anyway, um, yeah, I think for me, it was a, a kind of phenomenal um, existential transformation when I saw these, these incredible creatures. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, makes me think, uh, Meryl, in your exhibition, you, you choose a specific display. It's very dark with a dramatic um, focus of a light on your pieces, but also on these Victorian um, uh, birds collection. Um, I, I was curious to know what was um, um, the influence on this display. Was it to, 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 to be more in a Victorian ambience or a morning parlor, uh, you know, mourning the death of all these birds uh, gathered in your room. What was uh, the purpose of his display? Yeah, so the, the choice of painting the room dark um, was kind of both um, practical, but also evocative. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, there was several technical concerns that um, kind of were just talked about in terms of making the room dark. I mean, specifically one was to um, keep low light levels for the museum objects. Um, but then also I had this, um, uh, you know, video projection that was very close to other, the other um, uh, artworks, um, but it needed to, you know, um, uh, be dark enough so you could see the video projection. So, um, but then, yeah, at the same time, I did kind of want to evoke this, this atmosphere of, um, you know, kind of respect and, and contemplation, really, um, well, when entering the room. So, um, I mean, when you, you enter the room, um, you know, there's, you hear, uh, it's not silent, you know, there, um, I know we might talk about that later, but when you enter the room, there is this sound element as well. Um, you hear, you know, this kind of forested sound uh, with birds, birds, bird songs, and also kind of maybe more of a bit of an ominous call of, of a crow. So, um, so I think it's, it's uh, well, the funny thing is I haven't actually been, been able to go to the exhibition myself because of COVID. So this is all in my head, right, of how, you know, I'm also, you know, thinking of how the viewer would, uh, would go in and you've actually been to it. So <laughs> it's interesting to hear your, your, your kind of take on, on how it feels going in. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, 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 there, there is those elements, as you say, to, um, that feeling kind of, and yeah, right along the lines of things that I was thinking about um, when I was, um, yeah, kind of designing that space. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, this juxtaposition with the sound of cheeping birds mm -hmm. and we, we, we can hear the birds and all that at the same time, the dead birds in the vitrine seems more and more odd as, as you go into the room and um, I was thinking uh, about your display Sarah because you also chose a Victorian um, aesthetic to display this uh, fire screen uh, cabinet or this glass cabinet full of exotic birds and um, you've been interested a lot uh, about the Victorian culture of these birds and feathers. So I, I wanted to uh, hear you more about this um, Victorian um, culture, your approach with your uh, Avera series. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> it's a really strange and interesting period of history. Um, you know, these vitrines were made at this time and I wanted people to understand using this sort of Victorian aesthetic, but also creating a, a mock Victorian parlor, 
was that this was where these objects resided. They lived in people's homes. And um, this was a way that a middle or upper class family could demonstrate um, their education, their interests, their class. But it's also where the family photo album lived. Um, and so for me, it was this really interesting collapsing of this social space, this social cultural space where all these ideas came together. Then the other layer that I'll add to that is um, in addition to this fervent interest in science, this was also the period of spiritual, the spiritualist movement, which was a, a sort of superstition, if you will, which also took place in the parlor. So I felt like the parlor was this place where all these very strange ideas, some scientific, some uh, beyond science kind of came together and collapsed. And if you will, maybe gave birth to these very strange hybrid photo pictures that I created. So yeah, the parlor was this place where I could reference a lot of these Victorian themes. They also were very obsessed with death. So death, death culture, the sort of, uh, uh, formal mourning, uh, all these sort of rituals around that, public rituals really um, expanded greatly during the Victorian period. Giovanni, um, uh, we, I wanted to, to, to go back to a thing you said at the beginning. So this um, uh, thing that is clear in Merrill's exhibition uh, about uh, the way we throw, we've frozen the indigenous cultures uh, into an idealized state and uh, and this parallel with uh, taxidermy. Do, do you want to elaborate with, with Merrill about that? Sure. Um, I think what's interesting about using taxidermy as a metaphor to the silencing of indigenous cultures is related to time, uh, the stilling of time that taxidermy operates, the preservation practice that taxidermy is part of, what we, would call, we could call uh, a preservation project of, of natural history that expands beyond the animal world. And the overlap between human and non-human in institutions like natural history museums, which is something I think we should be talking more about uh, at this point, because ethnography and anthropology have brought great wealth of information and uh, have expanded our understanding of the world. And yet at time uncomfortably conflated human and non-human in ways that are deeply problematic today. It happens often to me uh, here in Chicago at the Field Museum to visit uh, with students uh, who feel more and more um, troubled by the presence of African artifact, of Native American artifacts at the Natural History Museum and ask why are they here in the first place? And I think uh, that is a fair question, especially as the uh, counter uh, question I pose to them is, why isn't a Renaissance painting here? You know, there's these misalignments between culture and culture that have been passed down to us by institutions. And what I think is problematic is that natural history museums remain uh, a center point of reference for school children. So we bring our school children uh, to natural history museums and often they're not prepared to take on the subject critically as we are and therefore serve them the displays of the natural history museums as transparent, as nature. And I think the um, idea of addressing taxidermy as a metaphor to the ways in which the West has also treated uh, indigenous cultures is very cunning. Also in the context, in the poetic context that Merrill has uh, brought to the fore, which is the, the notion of sound with the, with the idea of silencing. It's not just the notion of indigenous cultures being stuck in the past, indigenous cultures as something to preserve for uh, the benefit of the West, but also this silencing and, and sidelining marginalization, which is part of the process of objectifying 
which I think uh, indigenous cultures have been part of. So uh, to use taxidermy the way metal is done in this context and with the accent on silencing really brings something powerful uh, to the gallery. Yeah, and I, you know, I could add to that, like, um, you know, museums collected objects, um, you know, during times that we were forbidden um, to, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> be basically and um and you know museum collections and even going through the museum collection at the mccord but it it just you know reminded me again um of the disappearance of our language and, and cultures you know during that time that museums were really um collecting many of our um you know important and sacred objects and and I mean, one of the lessons that um, I've been taught by elders is that um, the return to traditional, return to traditional knowledge, you know, involves um, seeing nature is going on forever, and that we are part of it. And you know, nature works in cycles, and and you know, repeat, repeats and continues. And um, in many ways, this exhibition. Um, uh, is about that lesson and um, you know the works show efforts to kind of control nature and kind of prevent time from passing by um, um, but you know instead I think we should look for knowledge in the world kind of around us and and um, you know accept our role you know in in this passing of time and and and, and one reason why I used for the first time, you know, um, you know, tax taxidermied birds. I mean, I haven't in the past. I usually make all my birds out of um, various material, found material. Um, but it's kind of um, in keeping with that. I mean, it's 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 you know, um, you know, what, from not from keeping these birds from um, returning to earth, you know, we are kind of in, interrupting their, their life cycle and kind of working against nature. So, um, so in part, you know, using, using this process, it, it is kind of a comment on that. And, and, um, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I really see, um, I, I think the way in which you contextualize taxidermy to me opens up a different interpretation whereby taxidermy can be seen as the interruption of natural processes, as you've just um, outlined, and which this also links to to Sarah's work, the acknowledgement that ultimately, mostly through natural history museums and natural history as a discipline and its its products like books, exhibitions, we have come to relate to nature mostly as images, still images up to a certain point then moving image uh, starting from the, the beginning of the last century. But the, the contingency uh, of this archive uh, in, in the way it shapes our understanding of nature and it has shaped the value of nature is very different. I think it, is, it has emboldened a very Western way to, to relate to the natural world that as I understand it is very different to um, that of indigenous cultures where being in the moment and being part is uh, so much more important than cataloging, archiving, preserving, uh, and, and creating histories. Exactly, that's very interesting because when I visited the show, I was so trained to look at dead birds, for example, as species, scientific knowledge. And here, Meryl, her proposal is more intuitive, more sensitive. It's not a lesson of science about exotic species disappearing or crowds or stalling. It was really disturbing for me because um, I'm Western trained. And I, I was um, wondering, um, was, was it a reaction toward uh, the domination of Western science on the animal realm for you, Meryl, to approach these taxidermy animals as um, um, with a relationship in a way more sensitive and not knowledge and not lesson? Yeah, I think, I think that's a fair interpretation of, um, yeah, the, you know, the, the exhibition kind of how I was responding. I mean, um, you know, I chose not to, um, 
you know, kind of label the the birds and, and everything with their their scientific name. I mean, it, it was a kind of a deliberate decision, but um, um, I don't think I would have, um, you know, approached um, presenting them in um, that way of kind of categorizing them um, as, you know, I, I mean, it was more of a reaction. I was making the work to kind of the societal and the, the you know, specifically to, you know, kind of the museum practices of capturing and, and, and kind of catalog, cataloging nature. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think my, my work, um, you know, involves more kind of um, an intuitive kind of relationship um, with the natural world. Um, and, you know, I guess technical descriptions, of course, um, they can be, they can be useful um, for the study of these animals. Um, I think, um, might distract from that feeling of relation that I was trying to kind of maybe create in the exhibition space, so. Thank you, Meryl. Um, I, I was thinking about your work, Sarah, um, especially um, this question of extinction of species that you included in Avery because you, you made these portraits uh, mixing cabinet uh, cards with um, extinct or endangered uh, species uh, of birds. And um, you produce these very strange portraits um, mixing animality and, and uh, humanity. And um, how, did you, uh, how did you manage this question of extinction? Because it's important to talk about this ecological issue, but I think it can be also a kind of screen uh, between us and the birds and the the animal culture in general. So I, I was curious to know how you you dealt with um, you know this balance uh, between the ecology the ecological issue, the cultural issue, the the all Victorian culture and and so on. It's really rich and difficult to balance everything. Yeah, you know I I think um, in. Similar to to Meryl, I think as artists, there's there's thinking and there's doing, and um, certainly all those issues are in your mind. But I think when you're making something, it's very it's a very experimental process, and you have this idea that you know perhaps I can collapse these two forms of visuality. I can create this hybrid human bird creature, and what would that look like? You know, I didn't know when I started, I didn't even have the skills in Photoshop to do it. I had to learn and I had to keep going back to the lab and photographing very, very small sections of the bird in detail so I could do this blending. And so the first time I saw this very strange, disturbing hybrid creature that I had created by collapsing these two things together, you know, my own response to it is like, what am I doing? I, I, I don't even know what this is. Like, it's so weird. But at the same time, I felt very compelled to think about um, this connection and disconnection between us and nature, very beautifully expressed by Meryl. And I think, I think empathy is really what I've been thinking about since 2013, since I was in the laboratory, is that I think one of our biggest problems as humans is that we are disconnected. We, we do not see ourselves as part of nature. We see ourselves above nature. We try to, we're always trying to control nature, um, re-engineer nature um, to its detriment and our detriment. So this very simple, if you will, gesture of collapsing um, and creating these very strange creatures is really, I, you know, was looking at my own notes, like to say, what would it be like? What, how would we relate to the world if we saw through the eyes of the birds? You know, how, how might we live differently? And, and thinking about what Meryl said about the crow dance, you know, it's this idea of, of being connected, not separated. So, yeah, that's what I was trying to do and um, in creating those those beings, if you will. Thank you, Sarah. Giovanni, would you say that um, this um, uh, issue of extinction uh, is um, overwhelming today, the taxidermy in, in the art? It's uh, maybe 
uh, it's maybe too present uh, and we should focus as Mary's, uh, Meryl Dad, uh, did, did, sorry, uh, about this question of culture and indigenous culture for, uh, specifically. Uh, would you say that, yeah, we're, we're talking about extinction and loss using taxonomy, but it's not only that, and it maybe it's way too much currently to talk uh, all, all the time about ecology and extinction and loss. I think this is, uh, uh, these are interesting times in art for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I have written more than once, uh, I've called out institutions and uh, curators for relegating art to, to the lower ranks uh, of genres many times over the past few years. As we know, this is a condition that was theorized by Italian and French academics during the 17th century and became the norm uh, in the production of Western paintings. So still life paintings with plants, flowers and animals were at the very bottom, landscape was nearby. At the very top, of course, is the human with history, mythology and religion. And that's how we have been brainwashed over uh, 500 years of Western art to prioritize our subjects. And I have to say, when I started to become involved with the uh, animal studies movement in, in philosophy and art at the beginning uh, of the millennium, just about 20 years ago, I still noticed that predominance of um, hierarchy. And you, I could see a little change that then became a big change because of climate change and the, the, the more dramatic uh, level of information we're exposed to today. And while I think that that's very good, I still remain very suspicious about institutions in general and what they stage. And I think it's great to see an exhibition like Merrill's, which is uh, connecting different themes uh, rather than pretending to save the world. Uh, I think uh, extinction and uh, the, 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 the mass sixth extinction and climate change are very real challenges, but the question is what can art do that goes beyond uh, education and information? And that's not to say that those are not important fields in, in which to operate, but what can art do in the context of what's been done over the past hundred years um, and what we have been willing to talk about and not willing to talk about. And I think in the context of empathy, like Sarah was outlining, we find nestled another question, which is the question of interest. Why are we doing all this? Is it for our children because we have to pass on a planet for them to live in? Or is it because we are really trying to decenter everything that was negative about our human ways in order to grant this planet the right to survive us because it deserves it with all the others who have not contributed to uh, the destruction and um, manipulation of the past 500 years, to say the least. I think there are nestled responsibilities, ethical responsibilities here uh, that will require a few decades to um, process and really to understand what are our duties, what are um, our ethical desires driven by and what can art really accomplish? More recently, we have seen an amount of exhibitions somewhat um, staging gloom and doom scenarios, yeah. gloom and doom aesthetics. Yes. Uh, are they educationally worthwhile? Are we sensationalizing the sublime of the Anthropocene? Um, the questions are open, and I think that's why it's a very exciting, exciting moment. Um, Personally, it's hard to tell what art can do beyond the gallery walls, beyond changing minds that are prone to be changed. But I think um, finally striking the balance between extinction, climate change, and the broader network, which is also important, will be, will be the challenge. And taxidermy itself, I don't think, 
I think taxidermy has now been around for a while. You know, we've got roughly 20 years of intense taxidermy presence in the gallery space. Mm -hmm. um, great to see if it's ethically um, handled. So if the animals that are used in, in, the gallery, in the context of the gallery space have not detracted from the environment. There are many ways in which artists can legally acquire taxidermy specimens or repurpose taxidermy specimens. So I think it's it's complex. It's a complex intersection that that needs to be negotiated. And again, I think Merrill has done a great job at um, refreshing, dusting off taxidermy mounts uh, to to um, charge them with with more contemporary concerns. Exactly. Yes, you're right, and uh, especially with the uh, diversity of um, the birds uh, that Meryl used, uh, this, this uh, unnatural crow <laughs> with two <laughs> heads and, and the starling that is, is lying um, in the middle of this video installation as a, a dead bird and also as a scientific specimen, as we can see in all the museum drawers, full of, of, of corpses of, of dead birds and uh, that's very interesting to see um, this uh, wide range of presence of these animals uh, in Meryl's exhibition. Uh, I think we should see Leila appears to, because we're going to open the discussion to uh, the public here you are and uh, and so do we have already some questions? Not right away. And Not right away. Not right away, maybe we could continue a little more and then people who have questions, you could write it on the Q&A uh, directly sure. around the conference. Okay. I was wondering, um, to follow up uh, the discussion, Meryl, uh, you worked with a, a professional taxidermist uh, mm -hmm. to um, make these two birds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how did you... How did you manage the process? Um, I think the, those birds were in the collection or in the stock of the taxidermist or uh, how did you choose them? Yes, good question. So uh, yeah, so um, I um, was able to get in contact with a, a fellow Kevin Hockley who, um, who works in taxidermy and he actually sourced um, the two birds from the Royal Ontario Museum. And they have a program um, that uh, called the Fatal Light Pro Awareness Program, um, where they source um, uh, uh, birds in an eth ethical way. So um, you know, all the the birds have either been um, in a you know collision with a window, or um, you know have uh, you know been you know back you know hit by a vehicle or. Um, hit on someone, you know, hit the window through someone's home. So people bring them in. Um, so, uh, so he sourced the birds through there. And then, um, yeah, my request, obviously, uh, one of them was to make this double headed crow. So, um, so he, um, he produced that he also put the birds on mounts um, that uh, were all um, drawings that I gave him um, so that he could, uh, yeah, kind of create the feeling that I wanted from them. So, um, yeah, so it was, um, I was trying to remember when, I think it was in the, the springtime, I think when, or in the winter, I started talking with him. Um, but then in the springtime when um, he was sourcing the birds, because that's when a lot of migration was happening. And um, so this was back in 2020. So, uh, yeah, so... And then he drove them to my studio and uh, um, yeah, so I kind of saw them throughout his process of, of working on them. And then, um, yeah, and then in my studio, then I um, mounted them to the, the sculpture and everything like that. And, yeah. Thank you, Meryl. I think, Sarah, you, you worked also with the Fatal Light Awareness uh, Program of the Royal Ontario Museum. You, you, you made uh, several um performances i think for them uh yes they were very inspiring also um every year they do an, a, a large education program at the royal ontario museum and um they do a, an what they call an annual bird layout and they have all these volunteers that lay out these birds in a big 
form of some kind of big shape. And one time I was there, they laid out 1800 birds, all of them that had died because they hit buildings in Toronto. So their, their program is to make people aware of the fact that light is attractive to birds, reflective surfaces are attractive to birds. And there are things that we can do. So modern cities are a disaster for birds. So that there are things that we can do to treat our windows and our buildings so that we don't attract and kill birds because birds have ancient migratory patterns that go back thousands and thousands of years and they can't change those patterns. So unfortunately we build our cities on top of where they need to be and live and migrate without taking those things into account. And that's one of the, the big issues with birds, yeah. Absolutely, and and uh, speaking of that, uh, in uh, in the Q and R um, um, section, uh, Sharon Landon uh, writes us that she uh, found an injured uh, yellow-billed cuckoo bird migrating through Chicago, and and uh, fortunately the uh, bird passed out, and uh, she kept it in a freezer, trying to find um, a solution for for these birds, and. Uh, as we were talking, this association working with uh, with the birds and with uh, um, this problem during migration uh, are very, very useful. And uh, they're working with artists and uh, and cultural institution to uh, uh, get more and more pe uh, people aware of this problem in big cities. And, uh, and uh, I think, there, is, there are a lot of artists now indicating the source of the birds or animals that we are using for the taxonomy because I, I think now the, the public is more and more um, aware uh, that uh, the provenance of these animals should be really uh, clear and, and really clean because Obviously, the exotic birds in the bell jars in, in the exhibition of Merrill, they've been killed for uh, this uh, staging uh, of fake nature. So uh, it's not the case anymore. We don't kill any more uh, animals for um, uh, the purpose of an artwork. And it's very important to, to uh, really mention it because uh, it has been an issue for centuries. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. Uh, it, we're we're not hunting animals to get them taxidermy uh, taxidermized now. Uh, do we have other question in the Q and A section? No. Um, there, there Sarah, is, there is one question. Yes, I could go. I, I think Sarah. Yeah, sure. Before I think Sarah, you shared a link, right? For. Uh, for, from an organization where people... I, yeah, I put the flap link in the window, in the chat uh, window, if anyone's interested in looking them up. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question from Hélène Sanson from uh, the McCord Museum, Giovanni and Benedict. Do you see a trend in contemporary art to address issue about animals in general, about their inner relationship with humans? Please go ahead, Giovanni. Yes, I guess um, there certainly has been a change in the uh, a shake up in the hierarchies of genres whereby uh, animals have taken over uh, the past 20 years. There's been an increase, not just in taxidermy, but very many interesting contemporary artists bringing in a very controversial way sometimes live animals to the gallery space, but more especially in other media like video performance. Uh, the animal question has generated a lot of interest in philosophy as well as contemporary art. And we are now at the beginning of uh, the, the emergence of plants in, in contemporary art. So after we managed to acknowledge the existence of animals and engage with them in, in ways that are not perhaps so objectifying, and reductive as it has been in the past. Now it seems like we're ready for plans. There has also been uh, a few uh, interesting exhibitions happening in the United Kingdom uh, about fungi. So I think generally our interest for the non-human in philosophy and, and in art, you know, artists have been working on these subjects 
a lot longer, for a lot longer than institutions have been uh, ready to exhibit them. There's always different tiers of activity where you feel like philosophers got there at some point, artists were there first, and institutions come in somewhat at times a little late thinking, okay, yes, this has been around enough that we can actually um, place a bet and then display it. But the conversation usually when it appears at the institutional level has taken place for, for a few years, even only because setting up an exhibition takes many years of work. You're right. And uh, I will add to what you said that um, these uh, issues about animals are very present, uh, specifically the um, intelligence of animals, the cleverness of animals, their uh, sensibility and uh, their, sens their sentience are very important in our uh, contemporary artworks right now. And um, we're, um, it's very important also in, in art history to see how students are very uh, demanding about all these animal studies and uh, being more and more aware of these um, animal ethics. And um, it's, it's, it's really uh, wonderful to see the evolution uh, with, with young students in art history and uh, visual arts. And I, I'm sure, Sarah, you're, you're teaching too at, uh, at the Ryerson um, University. And I, I'm sure it's the same thing for your students. They're um, really, uh, they're eager to know more about uh, animals, about, of course, ecological issues linked to animal animality, but not only that, the, the animal as really a, a personality, a, an intelligence, a, a sensibility. I think it's, uh, it's, mm, it's clear every day. Sarah, do you, do you have any, any comment on that? Um, no, I would say there's a certainly a rising consciousness. Um, I, I think I, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but I think humans are extremely arrogant. <laughs> um, I think that we think we're, we know everything. And I just uh, think we don't. I think we know very little about what animals think and feel and their sensibilities and their intuition and their understanding. And I think Anyone who loves animals and spends times with time with animals um, is uh, amazed every day at how intelligent they are. And um, so, um, yes, I, I think my students are are quite woke. Um, they're very conscious of you know social issues, political issues, um, and environmental issues, and 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 they give me hope you know, for, for what's to come, because, um, you know, my generation and before, I think it was a lot of, um, you know, not perhaps not conscious cruelty, but a lot of ignorance, you know, of not understanding what was at stake. And I think we understand now what's at stake, right? Yeah, and it seems, uh... It's super positive. It's not only a question of extinction and loss. It's super positive to see yeah. this huge realm of, of thing to, to, to learn and discover and love yeah. and, and feel. And yeah. um, this empathy, we, we, we are also able to show today. Because I think it's, it's one of the questions in, in the show of Meryl, where... Yeah now able to, 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 to really be proud of our empathy and sensibility for the animal um, issues and um, nature issues. Uh, it's, it's quite new, I think, or quite recent to really being able, especially in an art gallery, to show our empathy and our sensibility for the animal kingdom and the animal uh, intelligence. Uh, there's, a, there's another um, question of Sabrina Deschen. Why the treatment and the reaction between taxidermy animals and animal and human rest is so different? Is the treatment of an exhibition about both need to be treated differently? Mm -hmm. Do you have any, Sarah, Meryl, do you have any idea about that? I don't know if I quite understand 
question. Um, why the treatment and the reaction between taxidermy animals and human rest is so different. Human rests. I don't know. I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I don't know. I don't know if Sarah has. She maybe if you understand the question, but. I'm not entirely clear. Okay. Also. Yeah. Um. I yeah, Serena, I think, uh, maybe <laughs> if she's out there, <laughs> can <yeah>. she? <laughs> uh, maybe it's a translation. Um, yeah, I don't know, but it, yeah, if you if you figure out, um, for example, medical uh, human um, taxidermy. I don't know if we can talk about taxidermy when it's about human, even if it's mm -hmm. a medical specimen. I, I I don't know. You should help us with this, Giovanni. But um. Uh, I think, yeah, it's more emotional when we see um, dead uh, human bodies taxidermied for the science, for the medical, instead of animal. I think, yeah, of course, it's more emotional. I can remember that uh, an exhibition toured uh, worldly um, around the world um, with human specimen, uh, you know, uh, taxidermied with the, the skin peeled off and you, you can see the muscles and everything. It's, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit weird and um, it could be emotional a lot, but I, I don't know if it's about that. And I don't know if we can talk about taxidermy for the humans. Is, yeah. it, is it? We can. Yeah. There, is, okay. there is such a thing which uh, unfortunately brings us back to colonialist experimentations. Uh, there is a, um, a historian who specializes in the history of taxidermy called Pat Morris, who wrote uh, an essay about human taxidermy. But I also see in the um, Q&A that there has been some clarification about the question where it's human remains that uh, mm. we're thinking of. So what is the difference really between taxidermy as animal remains and exhibiting uh, human remains. And I, I think my take, and it'd be very interesting to hear what other things, is, is one of empathy once again. Uh, taxidermy was made possible by this distancing be between us and animal lives. Uh, and that's why, in a sense, doing uh, applying taxidermy to humans is so much more problematic. You might remember, it's not a case of specific or technical taxidermy, but the Body World exhibition by Gunther van Outen that toured yeah. the world uh, was equally a massive success and uh, a, a, an ethical disaster on many levels because it does open um, a, a kind of worms when it comes to what is ethically plausible in terms of representation, what is suited to uh, remembrance, what is suited to celebration, what is suited to scientific knowledge. And the way in which the animal bodies are displayed is different from the way uh, human remains are displayed. For instance, the, the Christian church has made uh, incredible, um, it's made a history of relics uh, worthy of, of studying. And those are human remains that are uh, accepted and, and relished uh, around the world. So I, I think it's a very complex conversation to be had. But going back to the very, what I think is the very kernel of the question, I think it's really a question of empathy that uh, we can just, and again, you know, as I say that, I don't want to be wholly negative because I know many people who treat taxidermy as a form of celebration of animal mm -hmm. death. So taxidermy doesn't mean necessarily to disrespect and devalue the life of an animal, but to hunt the animal, to turn the animal into a taxidermy mount is different from finding a bird on the street that died and turning it into a taxidermy mount for a different reason. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think if we are more and more aware of um, animality, of uh, um, um, animal cleverness and sensibility, it would maybe end taxidermy one day that we, we won't be able to see and, and bear seeing uh, taxidermied animals into an exhibition because it would be non ethical at all. I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, 
data says no, because at the very time we have become more aware and empathic, taxidermy has gone through its biggest revival ever. So it's not just philosophy or artists uh, becoming aware of taxidermy. It was in the coffee shop, in the bar, in the design studio, everywhere you went, taxidermy followed and uh, it's still there. I, I think what I, I, I think one of the things we have to learn um, is basically we're rediscovering our, our relationship with history once again, right? We humanities goes through this constant realization. The question is, what is history? What do we do with it? And uh, I think we're at another interesting junction of what do we do with our past? Do we destroy it? Do we erase it? Do we recontextualize it? Are we capable of recontextualizing it so that it's acceptable and so that it makes sense to more perspectives than the white male perspective to which everything made sense uh, up until recently. So my, my uh, curiosity for Merrill's work, what let's say I, I very much appreciated was Merrill's uh, determination to engage with taxidermy from an indigenous perspective instead of shunning it away as an evil manifestation of white supremacy. And, and I think that that is the kind of integration mediation uh, that we need to see, that we need the most. Because as we know from psychoanalysis, pushing things away doesn't solve the problem. So that's one of the things I actually wanted. I don't know if we have any time left at this point, but I wanted to see if Merrill has anything to say about this, this engagement, you know, this dialogue that, um, she is established with taxidermy instead of running away from it. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, it's, yeah, it's opened up a lot of different, um, well, just through my research and just understanding taxidermy myself within, um, you know, my First Nations heritage um, that I didn't kind of know before. I mean, you know, it's just opened myself up to to new thoughts, new new di internal dialogues and, and relationships also again with nature and my surroundings. And um, so I, I think that, uh, I don't know if I'll work with taxidermy again. I don't, in, in, in future projects, um, um, but who knows? I mean, I think again, there ha for me in particular, I think there'll have to be a lot of care and thought if I do work with it again. Um, and um, yeah, I, I won't just work for it out of the sake of to have, you know, a lifelike, you know, kind of um, animal, um, you know, beside me or, or within the exhibition space. I think they'll, um, you know, they'll have to be, you know, some sort of reason, you know, to, to use it. So, um, so anyways, I um, will we'll kind of see, you know, um, in, you know where, where my work takes me but um, uh, yeah it, it was interesting though what you said I think there's lot, lots of really um, yeah points that you made that uh, were were quite true and and it's it's really interesting to kind of um, hear you all talk about you know how you think about things um, and you know well this kind of taxidermy world and our relationship with animals and your relationships as well so um, so I've also taken away a lot from just this you know the the four of us <laughs> Every, everyone speaking so it's been really interesting so thank you all well thank you everyone thank you Benedict for uh doing the moderation of the uh, the event, Saha, Meryl, Giovanni for joining us. And uh, thank you to the public to being virtually here today. Obviously we invite you to discover the exhibition from Meryl at the uh, McCord Museum. Thank you for taking a little more time than we was, that was planned uh, for this encounter. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, have a great day. Thank Bye, you everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.